Our next is Dr. Dave Fleishano, who needs no introduction. He has been a household name. He's past president of AAST. Uh, he has uh, been a lead in surgery. He's one of the editors of the major trauma text. Um, he is now a professor at Mercer, and he's obviously a senior attending at the Atlantic Medical Center. Dr. Uh, Fleishano is going to talk about peristomal hernia. A stoma should be moved to another site or taken down and GI continuity restored. He's going to take the pro of that. This is one of the questions that you all asked me to include for this year. So he's going to take the pro. Dr. Patricia Turner is going to take the con. Dr. Feliciano is actually representing my view. Dr. Feliciano. Debate concluded. <laughs> I was referred a, a 9 by 4 centimeter mucus seal, the appendix, three weeks ago in a 24-year-old transgender man, and we did it open. I think one of the things I learned in reviewing the data on the peristomal hernias is uh, we've got a little problem in general in colorectal surgery that I frankly wasn't aware of. I'm going to touch on the incidents and the other items listed on the slide there and then uh, complete with a discussion about reciting. If you look at some of the standard textbooks and a review article that are, that are listed there, you can see nobody actually knows the incidence, but if you summarize the three sets of figures listed there, it appears somehow the general surgeons in the recent past have had an incidence of approximately 15 to 25 percent of their stomas get a hernia. How many of you believe that figure? about 20 percent of you. I think it's outrageously high. I don't think it's my own experience because surgeons always say that, right? Now, if you look at the causes as described in one of the textbooks, they're talking about tangential forces. And then if you read a little further, it says the tangential forces are related to a radial force related to the intra-abdominal pressure and the radius of the abdominal cavity. I thought this was an incredible smoke screen when I read it. I mean, I'm just serious. I mean, why would somebody write that in a major textbook? And basically what the author of this chapter stated was that fat people are going to get more stomal hernias, right? So we might as well blame the patients. Another way to look at this is maybe we should blame the way we're training residents and general surgeons. I mean, all of us help residents do stomas periodically. And if you ever ask them what are the three or four most important steps in creating a stoma, you'll be lucky to get one of those three or four steps. And I think many people in my generation were trained with a three finger breadth diameter below, two finger breaths above, never excising fascia, because when fascia gets excised, it gets a cicatrix. Always make a cruciate incision. I think everybody recommends you try and bring it through the lateral one third of the rectus, though it's really hard to find good data that that prevents hernias. And then the issue that many people have discussed over the years, and none of us ever do, is take the time to tunnel our stomas extra peritoneally. But I'm a strong believer, as I think many of the other sen senior general surgeons in the room, in numbers one to three there. And, uh, the con position to me, so peristomal hernia, um, the stoma should be taken down or moved or GI continuity restored, the con position. So that's what I will try to uh, share with you today. So um, as Dr. Feliciano has told you, this is an important problem. Um, it's a big problem. Uh, so, um, it, a common complication of stoma formation is the formation of a peristomal hernia. Um, the incidence varies with the type of stoma. Um, I read a number of papers, but the reported incidence was as high as 48 percent for colostomies and as high as 28 percent for ileostomies. And really, if you think about it, um, the reality is, is that every time that we make an ostomy, we're creating a hernia. I mean, we are. We're sticking a hole in the abdominal wall, we're pulling something through it, and then we're trying to sort of pull the abdominal wall together around a loop of intestine, but the reality is, is we've created a hernia. We just hope it doesn't get any bigger than what we made. Um, and the fact is, is that as the law of Laplace says, um, as you increase the pressure in a cylinder, the pressure is going to focus at the point where the abdominal wall is thinnest and the pressure is the highest and the diameter, the radius is the widest. And so in any hernia, whether it's an abdominal wall hernia after a laparotomy or whether it's an, a peristomal hernia, the law of Laplace suggests that that's where the pressure is going to go to that weakest point. So it is no surprise to anyone then that when we've created a stoma that we get a lot of hernias, or it shouldn't be a surprise. 
And the symptoms, of course, range from uh, being asymptomatic all the way to incarceration and strangulation. So the patients can come to you with pain and say, oh, doc, you have to fix me. Or they can come with no complaints other than that it's unsightly. Or they can show up in your emergency department with a problem that has to be addressed right away. And the other issue is just that you know when they don't when they have the um, their hernia their appliances may fit poorly which leads them to poor quality of life and poor patient satisfaction so they may come to you saying you know I just can't live like this because of the way that my abdominal wall is now contoured my appliances don't fit I can't leave my house it's you know devastating so it's a big problem so um, I won't read you the list but there are a number of associated factors um, the unfortunate irony is that some of these associated factors are associated with the very disease process that created the problem for which they needed a hernia in the first place. So if you have bad uh, inflammatory bowel disease and you're on a number of steroids and immunosuppressant agents to treat that, then you are now in a much higher risk category than someone else. And you also have that hostile abdomen that Dr. Feliciano spoke about, which makes us as surgeons much less inclined to go in there and try to fix it because perfect is, as we know, often the enemy of good. So these associated factors make this a challenging problem as well. So what are some of the treatment modalities? So certainly relocation of the stoma and restoring continuity. Obviously that's great if you can do that. But for some of the reasons that have been discussed, either this may be a permanent ostomy that cannot be taken down. It may be that the abdomen is so hostile that you wonder if you'll do more harm than good going in there and slogging through um, the abdomen to create potentially anerotomies or other sorts of problems. 